Greetings folks, Professor Fiore here, and in this video we are going to take a look AC analysis of an RLC series circuit using a current source. So there's a couple things I want to look at here. Now first, we have seen a series RLC circuit using a voltage source in a preceding video. But we're going to use a current source here. There's a couple things I want to look at. The first one is, using a current source, I think the phase relationships perhaps are a little bit easier to see. So you can do a phasor diagram and it'll be very obvious what's going on with the phase relationships between the various components. And to help us along there, instead of using Tina TI, I am using uh, the student version of Tina 12 because that has a phasor plot function in it. Now, if you don't have that or you don't have Tina Cloud, student version of Tina Cloud, um, you can do this manually. You can just get out a piece of graph paper and draw this, but I'm going to use the, the um, like I said, the, the, the version 12 because it's built in. It's going to save us a little time. All right. Second thing I'm looking at here are some practical issues regarding simulation. There are things that if you're not careful, they can kind of throw you for a loop, you know, bite you in the ankle, um, get some kind of weird results, might, might get you a little confused. So I want to put those things out there as well. Some practical issues with simulation. Sometimes people trust the simulator a little bit too much. It's not a second brain, okay? Simulator is a tool. So, you know, it's like a hammer. You know, it's like a screwdriver. What do you do with it? You have to know what to do with it, right? You can't just blame the tool. The tool doesn't have intelligence. You know, if things don't work out right, maybe it's not the tool. Maybe it's the person using the tool. Okay, so we got to be aware of those things. Anyway, what we have here, this is a circuit very similar to the one we looked at in a, uh, a series AC simulation with the voltage source. Got a 1K resistor, 100 millihenry coil, and a 100 nanofarad capacitor. All right, so I've come over here, calculated out my values using the standard equations, 2 pi FL for X of L. All right, that works out to J628, 628 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. X sub C, 1 over 2 pi FC, that works out to 1592 capacitive, minus J or minus 90 degrees, however you want to say that. And then the series combination, we just add these three, these three things together. Of course, the inductor and the capacitor, because they are 180 degrees out of phase, will partially cancel. So the cap here is bigger. We've got a larger capacitive reactance than inductive reactance. So that sort of wins out when we add these two things together, these two reactive components, we end up with a, a minus J964, in other words, a net capacitive value. So this impedance, 1K minus J964 can also be written in polar form as 1.39K at an angle of minus 44 degrees. Now, to find the individual voltages, right, when we had the voltage source, what we would do is um, take that voltage source, divide it by the uh, combined impedance, figure out a current, and then multiply through using Ohm's law. Alternately, you could use some kind of voltage divider rule thing if you wanted to. Nice thing about using a current source here is that I'm going to use that as my reference angle. In other words, I've got a 10 milliamp peak sine wave, all right, at zero degrees. So I'm just going to multiply that value, 10 milliamps at zero degrees, by each one of these uh, resistance reactance values to get the appropriate voltage. So for the resistor, right, it's just I times R, 10 mils at zero degrees times 1K, that gives us 10 volts at zero degrees. No biggie, right? For the cap, similar, 10 milliamps at zero degrees times the minus J, 1592, that gives us 15.92 volts at nine, minus 90 degrees. For the inductor, 10 mils at zero times the 628 at 90, or plus J628, however you want to say that, gives us 6.28 volts at plus 90. And because these two things uh, partially cancel, it's good to see what VLC is, right? So just that combination is 10 mils times the minus J964, which gives us 9.64 at an angle of minus 90. And then to get the whole thing, right, we can just multiply the current by the impedance value. 
um, the, the complete series uh, impedance value. So that'll be the 10 mils times the uh, 1K at minus, uh, minus J964, 1.39K at minus 44. And that will work out to 13.9 volts at minus 44 degrees. All right, okay. So we build this thing up and we're gonna go and simulate it. Now, if you just do this straight up, right? So you could use Tina TI on this, build this up. Hey, let me go do a trans analysis. If you do, you will see something kind of weird at your output. It won't look quite right. Some of your signals, some of the sine waves coming out are gonna have a, a really large offset, a really large like multiple volt DC offset. That's what it's gonna look like. Um, and it's, this is not unique to Tina, right? Um, I've tried this with other simulators, this sort of thing, and it happens. It's kind of the way it is. There are ways around it, and that's what I wanna show you, okay? Things that you can do to prevent this. You just don't blindly trust the tool, all right? One of the things that will happen, particularly when you're using current sources, is you might get some kind of irregular circuit error. And, you know, there are different reasons where, where this can happen. Um, for example, if you have multiple voltage sources in parallel, they, when, you, when you look at the equivalents, like the Thevenin equivalent, you wind up with shorted voltage sources. All right, so, you know, the simulator doesn't know what to do with that. So you have a, you know, you would get a theoretically an infinite current, right? So, you know, a solution for that, and we've seen this in some other work, a solution for that is to put a really tiny internal impedance in series with that voltage source. And if your simulator doesn't have that ability to actually adjust the internal impedance of the voltage source, you can just add a little external resistor, right? Well, the same kind of thing happens with current sources, but in this case, you have to add a very, very large impedance in parallel with it. So what I've done here on this current source, because um, again, you're gonna get one of these weird kind of errors, uh, I've set the internal impedance to one giga ohm. So I'm gonna click on this and you can see right here where it says internal resistance, one giga, okay? Or giga if you per prefer, but it's really a, a soft G, all right? So it's a large value, huge value compared to every, everything else that's out here. It's not really gonna affect anything, but it will allow the simulation to proceed without error. And that's important, okay? All right, so anyway, there's that. Another thing that you have to deal with, like I mentioned initially, this, this issue about things being offset is because the capacitor voltage, right? We got a sine wave going through here. That capacitor voltage is fluctuating. And when we calculate this, we're talking about peak values, right? But initially, what is the value of the capacitor voltage? Well, in most simulators, everything is initialized at zero. But that's not really what it would be, you know, at a particular point in the cycle. So, in fact, if you look at this, um, where the current source would be zero, you actually have a big negative peak <laughs> for the capacitor voltage. So what ends up happening is um, the, the simulator will often, not always, but often will sort of compensate by just shifting everything up. So that negative peak becomes zero, basically. How do you get around that? Well, what you do, at least in this case, one possibility is to add an initialization voltage for the capacitor. You just say, well, start it at this potential rather than zero, okay? Since I know the negative peak is gonna be 15.92 volts, right? I've calculated that back here. That's what I'm gonna set the initial value to the capacitor to. I'm not gonna assume it's zero, all right? So you'll see right here, it says initial voltage. I'm setting that to 15.92. So when I turn the switch on, we're saying, well, the cap already has 15.92 volts on it, all right? It's, um, you know, I would consider that to be a less than perfect solution, but it does work. You know, some simulators will actually start at zero. That's really good. I actually prefer that. The problem is it may take several cycles for the circuit to actually settle out. So that if you look at the time from, you know, zero to a couple of milliseconds, things are going to look really kind of messed up. So, you know, it's a six of one half dozen of the other kind of thing. Um, and 
to be quite honest, this is why habitually I usually start simulations not at zero. You know, I'll usually start them a, a couple of milliseconds in just in case there's a little startup transient from the simulator. But anyway, um, I've solved a couple of these problems, right? A, a simulation error circuit and a, a simulation offset through these two little things. So these are things to keep in the back of your mind, right? If you get a, a, an irregular circuit, a problem with the circuit, start thinking in terms of, of a voltage source having a really tiny internal impedance or a current source having a really large parallel impedance, right? And again, if your source doesn't have that facility, you can just add an external resistor out here that's a really, really big value. Just make sure it's several, and I mean several orders of magnitude larger than anything you have, right? So I got a 1K resistor. I set this thing to one giga ohm. It's literally a million times bigger, okay? It's not really going to affect the simulation. All right, so having said all that, let's just do a transient analysis and see what we get. All right, so again, I'm starting from one millisecond, so that's a, basically a cycle in. Notice I've selected use initial conditions so that it uses that 15.92 negative volts across the cap, all right? Okay, so let me get rid of that. And I've actually added in here um, a couple of elements over here. All right, so they got the VRVL. I want to see a bunch of different things. All right, can I move that over there just a little bit? Okay, so I've added in my um, like post processor basically something like VLC, the combination of VL and VC. Okay, along with my VS, VR, VL, and VC, right? And I've given these some nice striking colors. All right, so let's do a quick comparison to our calculated values. All right, so right at the top here, right, this big one, that's VC. And we calculated VC to be 15.92 at minus 90 degrees. Okay, so um, there's 15 right there, so that looks pretty good amplitude-wise, minus 90. All right, so um, well, this is one kilohertz, so this is one full cycle. Here's half a cycle. That's a quarter of a cycle right there. Follow the bright red. There's your quarter cycle, so this thing has been delayed by a quarter of a cycle. It's been delayed by 90 degrees, right, because it would have started here, but it's been delayed, so that's negative, all right, negative 90 degrees. Looks good. All right, now, who's next? An antiphase to this, the dark green, now bright red, is VL. And VL, we said is 6.28 at plus 90, right? So minus 90 plus 90, that's 180 degrees. So we expect, you know, here's the VC again. Here's the VL. Notice they're, they're crossing right at zero. So these things are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. 6.28, yeah, there's 5, 6, yeah, so that looks good, all right? The amplitude looks good. The phase looks good. I'm happy with that. I'm going to jump right over to VLC, which is this sort of fuchsia kind of thing right here. Actually, it looks better just like fuchsia. Um, so that's the combination of the two, and as we calculated, because the capacitive reactance is bigger than the uh, inductive reactance, the capacitive sort of wins, in other words, um, we only get partial cancellation here of the capacitive from the inductive. And this is, so in other words, this, this sort of um, brownish red and this dark green combine to give us a fuchsia, right? So you subtract this dark green from this reddish brown and you get the fuchsia, okay? So we have the same phase, minus 90. It says 9.64 and, you know, there's 10, so there's 9. That looks great too, right? So far, uh, I'm a pretty happy guy. VR, that should be 10 volts at zero degrees. It should be perfectly in phase. Well, that's the bright green, the screaming, you know, lime green. So there's our zero, perfectly, right? Angle zero, it's going up to 10 volts, minus 10 volts. Happy, happy, joy, joy. I just love this. And the last thing is really the source voltage, right? And that happens to be the dark blue right here. Okay, that one I just clicked on. So that one, 
that's VS. We said that should be at about 14 volts, just shy of 14 volts at negative 44 degrees. All right. So, um, you know, again, there's 14, there's 15. So the amplitude looks about right. And uh, again, right, here's half a cycle. There's quarter cycle. In other words, there's 90. So that's just about 45. Again, it's delayed. It's late. So it's negative. All those things look great. Okay, so the time domain on here, um, that transient analysis looks wonderful. Now, here's where the advantage of using this version of Tina comes in. So if you want to do a phaser plot of this, right, you'd have to whip out a you know, piece of graph paper, put this stuff down, or you, know, you could use a, a plotting program. But um, you know, old school, sometimes I like to just get a piece of graph paper. It's good to get the pencil out. But in any case, the nice thing here is we can just come up and in the AC analysis, we can look for phaser diagram. Okay. Boom. There's my phaser diagram. So here's the individual pieces. Let's just put our thing on here so we can see the, the parts. So here's VR. All right. Notice this is, you know, real and the uh, imaginary, the reactive is this way. So here's the VR at 10 volts. Let me push this over so we can see it. All right, so 10 at zero, that's coming out like this. The VL plus 90 at 6.28 amplitude. So there's the 6.28 at plus 90. The VC, the real big one, the 15.92 at minus 90. All right, and then the VLC. So if we take the VL, we can see how well this works, right? You take this vector, add it to this vector. So you just take this tail piece and put it on this point, And then if you just took this, right, stuck it here, you could see it would end up right around here, right? In other words, the VLC, which we've calculated over here, 9.64 at minus 90, would be from just above that dotted line back, right? So this would be right along here, that would be the, um, the VLC. And remember, the VLC and the VR are going to combine to give you the source. So here's this uh, vertical piece, Here's the horizontal piece, and then the com combined vector right, would be right there. And as we calculated, that should be about 13.9 at minus 44. So this is telling us it's 13.88, right, rounding error. And you can see just by looking at this, yeah, that looks like it's around, you know, 45 degrees negative, 44 degrees negative. Everything's wonderful, right? You really have to like, uh, like the way this thing falls out for us. It looks really good, okay? So... Sometimes we like to have this kind of drawing because it's a very compact thing. You can see what's happening, right? And this works this way because the current is our reference. We have a constant current, so the current's zero degrees. Everything is with respect to that current, right? This can be a little busy. I try to see all the pieces and what's, what's going on with it. But you can derive from this, right, this phasor diagram. Okay. Now, when you do this with a voltage source, what ends up happening is this whole diagram gets tilted. And what ends up happening is Vs here, at least for this particular circuit, Vs would rotate back to the horizontal, and then the Vl would rotate this way, the Vc would rotate up that way, and we'd have something coming out like this, and there'd be a Vr out like that, right? It can be a little, you know, a little bit more confusing. The whole thing is rotated um, because you're using a constant voltage source, that zero degrees as your reference, okay? And the current winds up um, rotating around because of, you know, whatever the phase angle is on the impedance. This way, you know, we've got a fixed phase angle on the, on the uh, current, and we just go from there, all right? So, you know, if you haven't, in fact, seen the series RLC circuit with the voltage source, if you haven't seen that video, take a look at it and just compare the two. I've used the same components Everything is pretty much the same, all right? Just compare the two, see how it all works out, all right? Any questions? Put them down in the comments, and don't forget, if you don't have it already, you can download the associated textbook, the AC Circuit Analysis textbook, for free at my websites. And if you really want a hard copy, you can get that as well. The links are all in the description of this video, okay? Great. Take care and I'll see you next time.